Robertson, of course, uh, my co-host, Rudy Tanako. Uh, of, of course, Basics of Magic and BasicsofMagic.com. Welcome to the show this week. Uh, I hope you saw last week's show. It was awesome. I'm not going to say who it is. That way, it's kind of what we call evergreen in the business, meaning that um, it could be anybody. But we know that whoever you just got done watching in Magic, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh, today, we have in the wings, and I'm going to figure out how to put a curtain that goes, and then introduces the guest or ta-da or something like that. Very Muppet-esque, if we can. But uh, welcome to the show, Basics of Magic. Rudy, how's your week going so far? It's been a fantastic week being sheltered in place here with hardly <laughs> anything open to go and enjoy. What I, you know, I just love all the vineyards around here and hanging out with people. and So just staying at home, doing think, really nothing. I think it's nice yeah. that you just admitted that you pretty much are staying home and drinking. <laughs> that, part's, that part's awesome. Uh, well, hey, just in case you don't know what Basics of Magic is, Basics of Magic, and by the way, the ma magicians, the magiciansforum.com, which is where Rudy resides, uh, basicsofmagic.com, we kind of created this just sort of to give people kind of starting out in magic uh, the understanding of the art because we see so much internet magic or what I call crotch magic uh, where you just see this stuff and then people are doing it and there's no presentation and you're like, why don't you talk to me? Uh, and they're not producing doves or coins or something. They're just doing over here. So we want to kind of bring it back and bring the magic back to magic. And so with that being said, we've decided to grab some people that are pretty well known in this business. In this case, you're looking at one of them right now that I actually saw at the Magic Castle, I think about a year ago. And I was sitting really far up and with my wife and she was very excited to be there. And I sat there and I'm like, you know, I'm doing this thing so I'm not noticed. And uh, the person that's on this screen, Bruce Gold, by the way, decided to pick me for a bill in the or uh, in the lemon. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> damn, why me, dude? Not me, no, I'm good. And you're like, come on up. Anyway, um, I, I won't go too much into how much I admire your work as an actor and as a magician or a magician as an actor, but I'm just going to start off by saying, Bruce Gold, welcome to the show, my friend, and we're excited to have you. Thank you. Uh, happy to be joining you. And may I commend you. First of all, the admiration is mutual. Thank you. And may I commend you only after you had been on stage with me. Did it hit me? Wait, that's Will. No. And because I knew of you, but I didn't really know you very well at that point. My and mother so, says that. My, yeah. All the time. And then I and then I was just so pleased and delighted that you acted. Listen to these words like a normal person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, would you is, like me to hold the orange? Yeah. Right. So you didn't you know, you didn't act like uh, another performer trying to upstage oh. or be funnier or which, you know, is fine. You can do whatever you want up mm. there. I, I, I love the spontaneity of live performance. But you reacted genuinely. You didn't have that, oh, I've seen this a million times kind of look. And uh, I think you'll agree my routine is just, you know, it's a little different from the normal yes. presentation. And I make the spectator, which in this case was you, yes. the uh, hero of the effect at the end. So thank you for joining me on stage. So in essence, we have shared the stage together. We, so. we have, and there's one leaving in 10 minutes. That's a <laughs> cowboy joke. And uh, I will tell you that, yeah, and Rudy, I think you can agree with this, is that the he hecklers are okay with me because I've trained myself uh, highly to that one. But when a fellow magician or performer comes up on stage and tries to do steal the act, that's why I carry six shooters. Anyway, uh, Rudy, um, let's jump into some questions about magic and so on. Uh, at, please take it away. I want you to take the gauntlet and ask Bruce a question or two. Well, you know, one thing I was interested about because there's, uh, there's like I watched your your performance on Fool Us and in oh. <laughs> that video, you you said something that I thought was interesting, but you don't really go into it. It looks like it's a clip from some stage act where you say, "What is it about kids and their fascination with magic?" And I was curious, like, like, well, what is it with kids and a fascination with magic? Uh, some of what Will is trying to do here is to get beginners, uh, you know, started on the right foot. And some of those might be young people. And so I just wondered, what was your thought in there? Because I didn't get, I couldn't quite find the clip where that was taken from. What are your, what are your thoughts on what is the fascination with magic? That yeah, kind so, of uh, for, if you've seen any of the Penn and Teller shows, you know what they do in, uh, in the biz called an opening package. And it's a, 
a little bit of background on who the person is. And so we shot in Vegas and they asked me to bring in a, a bunch of different tricks. And then they just kind of took a longer interview and clipped out a few pieces. And uh, I, they asked me, you know, since I also do stand up comedy to do kind of a Jerry Seinfeld esque kind of a thing, like what's up with magicians and, you know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> So it really wasn't so much as making an important point oh. as to land, you know, what the flavor of the thing was uh, and to acknowledge I do comedy. But I do have something to say about this. And that is, is that I, you know, I am almost six, four. I shot up like a weed when I was in uh, junior high. My knees were not entirely reliable. I was not <laughs> terribly good at sports. I, it was me. Uh, and then the other guy who were always last, the two of us, you know. And so, you know, magic is a very empowering way for kids to relate to their peers. Mm -hmm. And it gives them a way to interact uh, that in a way that's very engaging for both themselves and for the person who do it. And as you may know, uh, people like Johnny Carson, Dick Cavett, Arsenio Hall, who are famous talk show hosts, all had magic in their background either Arsenio as a kid Hall, or you know that Arsenio you know uh -huh. who you know who Arsenio studied with you're not going to believe this it's absolutely true Johnny Thompson no Thompson yeah oh, I love him yeah yeah so for me it was it, it, it was a very empowering way for me to relate to my peers and I got a lot of satisfaction out of it and uh, I was just foolish enough to pursue it yeah. <laughs> and beyond my youth so let, let me ask you a question here and that is uh how did you did you start uh when you were eight did you get a svengali deck did you see a magician pull a rabbit out of whatever how did you start um and what was the first trick that you remember that's a good question. the first trick i remember was my uncle doing a trick with a penny and uh they get penny disappear and then he taught me to do it and he he also, he, I lived in South Florida and he lived uh, up north. And uh, uh, so I, I, I didn't get to see him very often, but he was a scout master for a time. Uh -huh. And so he was really great with kids. And he showed me this penny trick and I did it for everybody, of course. Yeah. And I was so fascinated. And then early on, I had seen Magic Land of Alakazam oh, wow. on TV. And I just was like, why isn't this on every day? What, what, where can I see this? You know, and, uh, but I was always very intrigued by magic that was kind of my start into it right. was you know basically an uncle making a penny appear right it seems, seems like such a classic story but what had happened was in second grade um i was in elementary school and i was ill and they wisely called my parents who then took me to the hospital because i had severe stomach pain and my appendix was about to rupture oh wow and so thankfully they got me there in time and it could have been a much different story, but uh, they operated very quickly and took the appendix out. And then somebody, <laughs> somebody said to me, what can we bring you? And you know what I said? A, a magic set. set. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to miss this opportunity to ask for something I really wanted. Yeah. You know, what are you going to get me, a bathrobe? No, right. a magic bathrobe. set. So, so that was the first magic set I have. And I actually tell a story in my show. Uh, I asked how many people had gotten a magic set as a kid, because many people do. And they probably had a very similar experience to my own, where they opened up the box and expected that it would be filled with miracles. And they found instructions, which was so disappointing. So uh, I kind of played with the tricks and I you know, realized, wait a minute, there's a technique, it's skill. Oh, it's not a power. Oh, <laughs> so... It wasn't until years later, a kiosk opened up in my local mall in, in uh, West Palm Beach, Florida. It used to be owned by Paul Diamond. Oh, wow. Fam famous magician of yeah, his yeah, era. Was, Everyone in King. magic of that era knew him right. So Paul Diamond, he had a kind of an acerbic persona, bigger than life kind of guy, but really great guy to know. And he kind of had that thing where he'd tease you like, a dad would, you know. And uh, so the Magic Fun Wagon opened there, and there was a gentleman named uh, Barry Gibb, uh, not connected to the Gibb brothers, yeah. uh, but he was the guy who was kind of running it, uh, Barry Gibbs, actually. And uh, I would, my parents would drop me off at the mall on a Saturday, 
And that kiosk was only about eight foot by 12 foot. But I, and it was shaped like a magic circus wagon. And in the windows were all the tricks you could buy. And I would stare into those windows thinking about I was saving up my money to buy one of those tricks. And then the guys, there was an opening on either side of the wagon where a demonstrator would sure. perform tricks. So I am sure I annoyed them week after week. <laughs> That's right. and, and I was saving up $16 to buy the appearing cane. Oh, wow. Because that would certainly make me a professional magician, yeah. having this professional prop. And what was more, more synonymous with a magician than an appearing cane? Uh, and also a slightly dangerous prop, which was yes. even better. Well, now so, it, nowadays, because, you know, I saw them on TV. Interesting thing is you see them doing it. I, it drives me nuts. But back in the day, I'm guessing the Johnson one that you had was like would kill a person. If it, oh my God! If that thing hit you in the face, you're done. I had stitches. gotten hit in the face because that thing is like pure energy. Yeah. yeah. I, have to, I have to tell you that I thought that when you were talking about the penny, uh, I'm sorry, when you were talking about going to the hospital, I truly thought maybe you had a method of making the penny disappear and you were using your mouth as a top it, uh, and you swallowed it or something like that. But it's interesting you didn't. Um, yeah, it was just you know they they asked me what could they bring me and I'm like. Magic set. Now, you, are, as a magician, uh, obviously you were very well known, but as an actor, mm. as an actor, you have uh, quite a, um, a resume and a body of work. Um, was that part of the magic, meaning that, because like when I started a, in uh, 38 years ago, the magician mm -hmm. I knew, Roy Slater, said, you know what, if you become a really good actor, you'll be a better magician. Well, then I kind of like went off and doing the acting, but uh, yeah. how did acting come into you? Uh, I studied speech and drama in college. And by that time I had been performing a lot of magic. And then I kind of made, I crossed the bridge in the stand-up comedy because a comedy club had opened up an hour away from where I lived. It was oh. called the Comic Strip and they had a sister club in New York. Oh. And so brief story there, I drove down two nights a week for open mic night, nice. got to go up at the end of the show. The rule was, if you didn't show up at the beginning of the show, you don't get to go up at the end oh. of the show, which was very wise because I got exposed to a lot of different styles of comedy. It really helped me to develop who I was. Yeah. Then they made me a regular, which meant I got to drive an hour down each way and, uh, to go up at the end of the show after the regular comics as a club regular, of course, for no money. Wow. And so I did that for a year and then I went on the road. So while I was doing that, I was also involved in theater in college. And then I had done some television in the area, some commercials and things. And then I came out to Los Angeles to pursue that with the dream of being on a sitcom. And uh, um, like some of the highlights, I got to be on uh, Full House for an oh, episode. Cool. I played a wacky weatherman. And they wanted the weatherman to have a very distinctive laugh, which was, they said, like a hyena. And... I have a laugh that is so intense or so loud that if I'm in a movie theater and I laugh, people will turn around to hell? see who, but it's genuine. It's genuine. As a professional comedian, I mostly acknowledge something as funny. I'll be like, mm, mm, funny. Oh, funny. Yeah. Good. Funny. Great. Ooh, good, <laughs> good timing. Good routine. Good you timing. know, it's so analytical for me. Yeah. So when I really get taken by something funny, it's like, <laughs> it's like, my friends imitate me. That's how they imitate me. They do. Ha <laughs> ha! And I guess, uh, I guess being, uh, being the kind of person who someone can do an imitation of, I guess that makes you powerful, right? <laughs> I mean, so, uh, so yeah, so I, I was really in, intrigued and followed acting and wanted to be a, uh, on a sitcom. And uh, uh, at the same time, I was also still doing comedy clubs. Uh, and then that eventually led to a transition on the cruise ships where I could make in one week, yeah. what I used to make in two weeks at a comedy club. So I yeah. could be on the ship for a week and then be home to be available for auditions and things like that. So it was really started back in uh, college. Yeah. Awesome. Rudy, throw something at him. Yeah, well, I was just curious, what, again, maybe get, getting back to your full uh, yeah, yeah. performance. Did you set out to fool Penn and Teller? Because I know some of us magicians can get kind of caught up in fooling other magicians. Yeah. Yeah entertaining audiences yeah, so did too, you yeah. feel like you're gonna pull Penn and Teller or did you go I'm just gonna be incredibly entertaining and funny 
And which was your focus for both? So everybody who's going to be on the show, um, you have to submit. And so I, I submitted seven different pieces to them all on video, each on a separate video. Mm. And they had so many card tricks and so many coin mm. tricks and so many things that were similar. And so they said, oh, we want you to do this trick called the Amazing Psychic Toaster. Now, that had become a staple in my act. Gosh, m more than 35 years ago, I started oh. doing it. Oh. I started doing it in comedy clubs. And early on in comedy clubs, you know, magicians were not respected because their perception was that you cheated because you bought a prop. And so, like, I was creating my own stuff, like this thing, The Amazing Psychic Toaster, which was actually the premise of which was suggest suggested to me by a magician named Chris Carey. And he said, oh, you do comedy. It'd be really funny if you, like, had toasted a piece of bread and then the card was on it. And I took that and I ran with it and created the entire routine. And when I worked my way up to headliner... Uh, I would then go out and do all stand-up comedy, and then in the last 10 minutes, they'd bring me back for an encore, and I'd do this psychic toaster oh, trick. Cool. And the idea of that trick was that the journey would be so fun and so comical that by the time I got to the revelation of the card, even if it was all a gag, they still would have loved it because, right? So the fact that it was, it actually worked, that I didn't just take out a piece of bread that was completely black from char and go, well, close enough. <laughs> they would have been fine with that. Yeah. But the card chosen was actually the card singed into the bread. That's awesome. And it was different every show. So they asked me to do that trick. Now, I'll tell you something no one knows. Uh, having done that trick for so long and then shifted into doing cruise ships, I had not done the toaster trick in at least a few years. Mm -hmm. And it was put away. And then um, I had some issues with the methodology in getting it to work perfectly when I went back to it. And then at the show, um, we we were kind of sequestered, and we didn't get to see the other acts. And so they gave me a brief moment before the show to look over the audience and choose someone. And they were suggesting this really pretty blonde with long, you know blue eyes and a great smile, and then this kind of tube top thing with a gauzy thing over it. And I said... I can't pick her. It's going to look like I'm trying to get over with the ladies. Hello. <laughs> it was just she was too overtly sexual Dirty. or sensual yeah. in her appearance. And I just didn't feel like it was right. And there was a girl with lo beautiful, long, dark hair. And she had a big flower. And she had a big smile. And she was Asian. Uh, I don't know from what part of Asia, but she was Asian. And I thought, oh, she would be good because when I do this gag about having a snake under the box, she'll, ah, she'll do something like that, right? The show took five and a half hours by the time I got there. Mm -hmm. I, pardon me, that wow. I got on stage. And so by now, the audience had been sitting for hours yeah, and hours yeah, and hours. Whatever. And I looked over, and the girl, the flower was down. <laughs> the lipstick was off. She's so over it, right? <laughs> And now I'm trying to pick, figure out who to pick now because they want to know from what side of the audience you're choosing from them so they know where to aim the cameras. Yeah. They don't, the camera people, they don't know who. They just know which side. Yeah. And so I went over and chose the Asian girl, and she came up. And she was a little reserved. And there are some moments in the routine that are very fun if they react and join in the fun of it. And she was a little more than reserved. So afterwards, I'm like, oh, you know, I, 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 I could have picked someone who was, you know, a little more Gregarious. reacted with a little more enthusiasm. Now, she did like the trick and she did have fun with it. But I was used to getting so much bigger of a response. So now, you know, <laughs> yeah, the, the you behind know, the scenes, in reaction. front of the curtain, behind the curtain, years before the curtain, you know, Absolutely. the whole story. Wow. Um, mm. Hey, listen, uh, ask another question, Rudy, because I just noticed I'm on 3% of my laptop, and I would be really unhappy if I lost this. So <laughs> ask another question. I don't know what I was thinking. Too much going on. Ask a question. Shazam. You're good. <laughs> you know, I, with one of the, the things that uh, many of a lot of magicians uh, have multiple talents, you know, magicians who are musicians, or in your case, right, you right, right. Compete. What are you more, do you find you're, that you're more passionate about magic? or comedy, I know you get to do both, but if you had to choose just one, would you mm. say, would you pick mm. magic or would you say comedy? 
Well, that's a good question. I really enjoy stand-up comedy because there's a velocity to it. You know, as a stand-up comic, as a good comic, you want to be getting a laugh every 10 or 15 seconds. And when you're really good, you're a conductor of an orchestra of laughter for the audience. Mm. And magic, as you know, is often more plot involved. You set something up and then it pays off. And in comedy, the longer you go between you, that 10, 15 second mark, the bigger the laugh has to be. Like if you tell a story that takes 30 seconds to a minute, it better be a gigantic laugh. Mm. And I have some storytelling elements in my live show that do get into a laugh where it actually rolls. And by that, I mean they laugh so much, I get to stand there as the laugh is going. Wow. Pardon me. I, <laughs> I had the almonds before the show. <laughs> uh, I, I get to uh, stand there and just make faces like... Yeah, 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 there you go. At all points of the audience, which is just not stepping on my lap, allowing the laugh to roll. Sure. In magic, my style is very humorous. I have serious pieces I want to do, and I'll do them in the context of a, like a one-man show at some point. But I love the humor of the situation. And I think I probably, because it was such a big part of my youth, I, if I had to choose, I'd be drawn to do the magic. Because it would still allow me to do the humor, but it would mm -hmm. allow me to do more than that. Because for me, now this is going to sound odd to anyone who's not a magician. I don't self-identify as a magician. Mm -hmm. Some people, that's a magician. They go out, what do you do? I'm a magician. You know, mm. that, it's so much ingrained uh, into their personality, and that is how they see themselves. And not that there's anything askew with no. that. For myself, people ask me what I do. I say, I'm an entertainer yeah. because I, I do so many different things. So my identity mm. is not that of a magician. I'm not going to go to a party and instantly pull out a deck of cards and try to impress <laughs> you and, and be validated in that way. Um, mm. So, and again, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's just not who I am. But I, I, I like the idea that the magic often has, you get a chance to do stories, you have production value, you can have visual aspects to it, you can have props that achieve moments of, you know, amazement and astonishment. And so I look at all of these as tools or skills that I have, you know. It would be like musical theater and saying, uh, oh, well, I like acting, so I'm going to stick with acting. And even though I can sing, I never want to sing on. Of course, you want to add singing into it. It's part of your toolkit, sure. so to speak. And it is one of the things that makes me the kind of entertainer I am and helps differentiate me from my peers. So, Yeah, you know, like uh, that, that's an interesting thought. And I, I'm going to segue into something that you're now doing. But uh, as a uh, same for me, when people go, oh, you're a trick roper, gunspitter, magician. But, uh, no, I'm an entertainer. And so everybody knows that when I get up and I do my thing, there's a chance I might. Uh, I do a lot of improv when I'm doing my act because, mm -hmm. you know, you have things, staples or parts where you can always rely on those things. But the part where you just kind of get out and engage with the audience is the entertainer. Um, you know, I, I'm the same way in the sense that um, I kind of believe that being an entertainer is more important, in my opinion, uh, than being a uh, juggler or a magician or a trick roper because everybody does that. And they mm. do the, what they do and everybody makes, you know, disappear and everybody whatever. The point is, is that the skills of having the presentation, which, again, I'm segueing, have kind of a little bit changed unless you get her to the mm. higher echelon of uh, magician or entertainer variety artist. Um, mm -hmm. Because our society now is hurry up, got to go. Yeah. Oh, God. You know, it's it's uh, they say with uh, YouTube or Instagram and I do a lot of that stuff that if you don't get them in the first five seconds, then you might as well move on. And and the, and the viral videos are based on here's what I'm giving you. Blah, 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 blah. And it, I feel like everybody's on crack. But well, you know, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's what TikTok is so popular now. It's, it's literally the, the old joke about short attention span theater. And really? when I lecture, one of the things I talk about is that the, uh, the attention span of people now is shorter than a goldfish. Yes. Uh, and, and, you know, gold, goldfish has about, you know, eight seconds of memory, you know. There. Uh, so uh, or it's either 12 or something like that, and the attention span for human beings is like eight to 10 seconds. 
And it's like, I, I just, when I perform, I just think like everybody's 10 seconds away from checking their phone. Absolutely. It's the philosophy. It's the philosophy behind everything I teach. Yes. As a teacher, I, I have a page on Facebook. You can look up called, uh, uh, it's called Engage, that's, Pro Tips for Performers and, that's and Presenters. That's a segue. That's you, a segue. You see the logo right over my shoulder yes, there. Yes, I do. Mm. And so my personal theory is this, an audience is only ever in two states. Actively engaged, the performer in the proceedings are disconnected and waiting, and the trick is to never make them wait. Mm -hmm. Now, suspense is different. It's waiting, but it's active because you're building anticipation. That's right. And so when I work with people, I go through and we really take the puzzle pieces of the act apart and look at them. And where is humor needed? Where is engagement needed? Where do you need to check in with the person on stage? Because they're waiting. And so we get rid of all the waiting. We take the humor and we bump it up a couple notches. We take the dialogue and we edit it down so it's concise and direct. Because as entertainers, for ourselves and for the audience, we must remove all ambiguity. No one should ever have to question what's expected of them because mm -hmm. that makes them nervous and fearful on right. stage. So when you're delivering instruction, you have to do it crystal clear and knowing that when they get up there, half of their mind is occupied with, Oh, I hope I don't say the wrong thing. I'm in front of all yeah. my peers. I don't want to look stupid. Yeah. And now you've already told them what to do. And they, what? They didn't even yeah. hear you because <laughs> they're too wrapped up in that. Now, let me, before we go any further, yeah. I need to say something. Uh, initially, we were going to do this on with my laptop, which is plugged in. My phone is not. If I, I'm on my phone, if suddenly I disappear, my battery has run out. I will, so, I will claim that that's part of the act. Okay, so if I, if I vanish, just applaud. Okay, yeah, uh, that, there we went, folks. That's great, just in his style. Uh, you know what? Interesting thing is, is that I, I do. Uh, I've been a keynote speaker for many years, and I do something on what's called simple sense, which is simplifying our lives, which deals with a lot of what I call hooked on iPhonics. <laughs> and, you know, and it's basically the same thing, but I tell people when I'm talking to Boeing or whoever, and they go, well, we got that hour. I go, I'm doing 45 minutes. And they go, why? I went, because I can guarantee, I'm pretty exciting, and I've got whips and ropes and all kinds of stuff, but I can right. guarantee you after about 20 minutes, they're going to be like, and then I go down to the audience and I call people on it because it's funny because it's part of my act. But same thing. But I'm glad that you introduced what you were talking about because that was a segue. Yeah. Tell us um, basically how to get a hold of where you would be. Now, on the lower third, you're going to see this anyway. But uh, yeah. where can we get your Bruce Gold and the, um, uh, right. the, the engaging stuff? Uh, I have a personal page on Facebook. Uh, it's Bruce Gold, and I post about the shows I do on the Engage page, but you won't really find them there. Um, but if you if you if you search Engage, comma Pro Tips for Performers, and that little curly curly Q for and like pen and teller yeah. uh, uh, for performers and presenters, you'll find that page on Facebook. I do a show every week or every other week called Engage. It's a free show. It's 30 to 40 minutes. And I break down a lot of my techniques. And I've been so gratified that through that show, people have contacted me for coaching. Now, I have awesome. been a consultant and a coach for performers and variety artists and entertainers and speakers. And I've also worked with some very big illusionists that you know and some AGT winners. And I, I did a project with Lucasfilm. So that I'm very, very familiar with that arena. And when I teach, it's very comprehensive about taking someone's act, breaking it down, finding the beats, finding, you know, how basically the, it, it's to solidify the engagement mm -hmm. and keep it unbroken and powerful throughout the entire show. So you'll find some of those kinds of uh, tips, uh, I call them pro tips, in each episode. You can go there and then there's a message button. You can hit the message button there, and uh, it'll send me a direct message. And uh, I'm I'm running a coaching special. I started doing it uh, last month uh, called the two two two. Now it's the two two three, and every month it will go up in price because, uh, believe me, in all honesty, and I've had people on the show who will say this themselves, it's many times below what I ordinarily charge. Right. So. Every month, it's going to go up until I eventually reach my actual fee that I normally get. But I know that there's a lot of magicians who have like a clearing right now in order to take that time and use it in a way that's constructive and invest that time in getting 
to another level with what they do mm -hmm. so that when they are working again, their prosperity will be at a higher level as well because the show will be more refined. Sure. And of course, that's the whole objective. It's a constant process of refinement. The show is never like locked down 100%. This is how I do it. I've been doing it for years. Likely you need to let go of some things and find some new things if you're doing it for many years. Some of us, not myself, are, are blessed to have a perfect act that serves right. them decade after decade. But most of us, especially if we have an interest in trying new things in the show, it's a constant process of refinement. Absolutely. Well, Bruce Gold, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, any last things, Rudy? No, it's just a, I'm learning a lot just listening to you. Because I, you know, the piece course that you have on Facebook, and it seriously, it challenged me to think about. It's kind yeah. of just a, just an aside. I just introducing myself as a magician sometimes it just feels weird. I am Rudy the magician. It never mm -hmm. quite feels right. I like this idea of this entertainer because I do music and other things. So it's a huge challenge my thinking. So I appreciate that yeah. very much. I, let me wrap up with two yeah, things yeah, that I sure. think would be good takeaways for people. One is when people ask us what I do, what they're really asking us is what can you do for me? I mean, generally they're showing interest in you, but everybody always wants to know what's in it for me. So you sell the benefit of your services, not the services themselves. So I take a room, I, I take a room full of strangers and they turn them into a, co into a shared appearance. Uh, <laughs> I take a room full of strangers and I turn it into a shared experience of laughter and astonishment. And now they're like, how do you do that? You know, so that's one thing. And the other thing is, as magicians, we're, it takes so much intensity often to complete the trick itself. We have dialogue to say, we have secret things to do, we have so much to concentrate on, we have angles, right? Mm. We forget that the person on stage with us and the people in the audience, they're not they're, they're, they are the reason for our being yeah. in the first place. It is the interaction and the shared experience with them that is the reason we do what we do. Otherwise, we can do the tricks at home, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So an audience wants to feel this experience they're having is happening for them the first time ever and that they get the experience. It's live and spontaneous and all of that. Uh, so the focus, especially the people on stage, stand here, hold this. No, get a table, get a coat rack. Make them formative in the outcome of what you are doing uh, so, so that they're engaged and the audience is experiencing it through them. And then my biggest pet peeve, this is what I'll close with. If you remember nothing else, <laughs> stop saying ladies and gentlemen. They are not, they are not ladies and gentlemen. They are individuals who have come together for a shared experience. When you say, ladies and gentlemen, you're creating a theatrical distance between you and the audience. And if you're doing it with purpose and with intention, ladies and gentlemen, and you intend for it to have that theatricality, then fine. Right. But otherwise, just say hello. Because if someone came over to your house for a party and you greeted them at the door, you'd be enthusiastic. You go, hey, I'm so glad you made it. Get your button here. You wouldn't go, hey, ladies and gentlemen, come on inside. They're not <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. They're individuals. And the secret, one of the foundational secrets of David Copperfield's success. And I, knew, I, I discovered this early on when I saw him perform in one of the last small venues he did before his stardom was so big he could sell out thousands and thousands of seats at a time. This was less than 500 seats in Tahoe. And he came out and I expected the production value and the illusions, whatever. And then he came forward to talk to us. And I thought, oh, something's gone wrong backstage. He's just talking to us. He's, he's not performing. What happened? And then I realized, oh, oh my God, he's talking to me. Yeah. That's what it felt like. It felt like he was talking to me. He wasn't talking to ladies and gentlemen. No. He wasn't talking to 300 or 500 people. He spoke as if he was speaking to one person. And it's been a pleasure being on with both of you. Ha thank you for having me here. Absolutely. Uh, I appreciate it. Bruce Gold, of course, you can go to brucegold.com. And if you don't know how to spell both of those, it's right there on the yeah. bottom. And little Check. caveat. Yeah. <laughs> the beauty of what I've done for the past couple decades being on cruise ships is that it's a self-sustaining uh, gig. So my website is 
from 2003. So don't judge me by that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be updating it, I oh, swear. That's funny. I was looking but at your thank website. You. Thank I, you. I was looking at your website going, damn, is this like 1985 or what? <laughs> 2003, uh, but, 2003. But I recommend, <laughs> that, uh, I recommend that you check out BruceGold.com, but more importantly, check out Facebook and check them out. And, of course, uh-oh. My lights just went out. Engage. Oh, there we go. That was uh, not supposed to happen. But anyway, yeah, and engage. What a yeah. great thing to say. The closing comments I can say about that is, is that we spend a lot of time nowadays. We're talking about social media, but unfortunately it has had the reverse effect. People are now becoming antisocial and uh, not engaging as much. Spend some time to right. sit and talk to people. As you're starting off in magic and learning how to do this, it is more important to me, and I bet the gentleman on this uh, show right now, for you to do less of a trick and do more of the engaging because that's what we're really trying mm -hmm. to see. Anybody can do the tricks you can do. I've got tons of things here you can buy for cheap. By the way, we can get them on the website as well. But really what we want to see is we want to see you. So everybody have a great time. Rudy, thanks again, and uh, we'll see you next time too. Right. Great. Magicians, thanks, fellas. TheMagiciansForum.com. Thank you, Bruce. I'm Will Roberts. Have fun and see you next time. I hope. And if we don't disappear, we're out of here. <laughs>